Well, the government had tried to sell off parts of the former naval base, which was about a 600 acre site, to the commercial sector. And the private sector took one look at what were essentially derelict uh, buildings, all on a very large scale, and said, no way, the cost of conversion are just far too high, and actually the legal constraints are. So government's solution was to create a charity, Chatham Historic Yard Trust, with two objectives, to preserve the site and its buildings in, in a, a way that is appropriate to their significance in British history, and to educate the public about that significance. And today, absolutely everything we do is based on those two charitable objectives. How we do that and meet those objectives is highly commercial. We're very entrepreneurial, we're very commercially minded. And the, the first trustees of the charity set out to uh, have a strategy that they described as the creation of a living museum. But their concept of a living museum was a place where people live, a place where people work, and a place where people visit museums to meet our second education objective to learn about the place. Because until you come here, you can never really get the full picture. Today we call that strategy a, a strategy of preservation through reuse um, and we are, I think, one of the best practitioners of reusing historic buildings anywhere in the country. Virtually every one of our buildings now has a productive use, not always a commercial use. And today we have 112 homes with about 400 residents living on the site. Those are largely on long leaseholds and we had the capital a long time ago which helped fund some of our other development. Um, we have 142 business tenants uh, in a range of buildings from essentially tin sheds which might be grade two star listed but they're still quite industrial buildings to wonderful uh, brick built office buildings and so on. Specialising a lot in the creative industries, we, we have a real creative industries cluster here. Not because we've necessarily set out to achieve that, but because the creative sector like the creative amb ambience of the site. Uh, annual turnover is about £4 million a year. Um, around about 80% of that is self-generated with some funding coming direct from DCMS who were one of the sponsoring bodies when we were established back in 1984 and we are a hub partner in Renaissance and the regions which has, has been tremendously beneficial in, in improving our museum standards. It's taken a while to get there. Um, and I think one of the great lessons to learn from our experience has been, had we had all the money we needed at the beginning, I think all of the mistakes that we've made on the way to getting to where we are would have been compounded in one go, and it wouldn't have been the project that it now is because we've learned. And the, the other fundamental issue is that, that this single strategy articulated originally as, as living museum, now as preservation through reuse, has been followed throughout, even at times when we had no idea what the uses in the buildings were going to be or what the, where the money was going to come from. But by, by taking a patient approach, right uses have come along and right funding has come along, sometimes commercial, sometimes um, charitable or from government or whatever. Um, again, lessons learned. The, the, the articulation of our preservation through reuse strategy as a living museum strategy was completely misunderstood by the local population. And they expected this to be something like a black country museum or a, a, a Bliss Hill at Ironbridge. And that was never the trustees' intention. It was always to create these homes, businesses, and, um, and visitor attractions and museums. And it, although the community was very much involved and huge efforts were made to get them involved, that, that kind of misunderstanding and then a feeling that we weren't delivering in those early days led them to feeling let down again as they felt they were by government. Um, now they kind of get it. And we've, we've, over the last five to seven years, we've, we've changed our communication strategy completely to say, actually, I'm much more interested in about telling, particularly the local community, about all the other things we do, rather than just the museum or the events and all of that. 
and they're so proud now of this, the, particularly the creative industries cluster. Um, and it, it, it is changing drive, uh, driving change in Midway, um, and is a core part of the regeneration process again now, and the people feel involved. And today we, we have um, something like 200 active volunteers on this site. Now there's no better expression of community engagement than that, and they, they, they do a fantastic job. We could not be without them, um, and they spread the word. Um, so I think sometimes you can overplan the community engagement and, and so on. If it, if it isn't natural, the public will know, your community will know. Um, probably the, the project that, that um, typifies best what we are, are achieving and have strived to achieve is the latest one that we've opened. It's called Number One Smithery. And it's um, a classic mixed income, um, mixed use partnership project with an absolute museum focus in a formerly completely derelict and totally at risk scheduled ancient monument. But I was, I was told as chief executive of this very large organisation, your primary goal is to find a use to that building, um, that must be sustainable, um, bring in an income, attract the public and be right for its location on a site. Uh, and it had no roof, it's a 4,000 square metre footprint building, very heavy industrial usage, a lot of archaeology in the floor. We had no money and no partners and by pure chance um, the director of the National Maritime Museum of the time, Roy Clare, who went on to lead the MLA, came on what I saw as a bit of a state visit if I'm honest. We were the small heritage kind of uh, local partner compared with the National Museum. And he said, as a National Museum, I'm being encouraged to get my collections out on display in the regions. There's got to be a plan here. Um, from that day, Roy really said, do you know, I think some of my other National Museum partners might be interested in this. It's absolutely politically right at the moment. And we hatched the plan that has now become number one smithery and in partnership eventually with the National Maritime Museum and the Imperial War Museum, we put a bid together to, to create a storage on display facility for all of their wonderful uh, maritime model collections. About a £16 million project that would save a scheduled ancient monument, so that was a great outcome. We'd bring two National Museum brands to Chatham, very important from a regeneration and image and identity issue, and um, find a home for their objects on display in a maritime location with lots of synergy. So win, 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 win. And the lottery uh, who we went to with a £16 million project said, yeah, it's, it's got all of the boxes ticked, but it's not very exciting. You know, do people really want to walk by that lot? Go around and think about it again. And we did. And what we decided to do was not put all the models on display, to consolidate them in um, high-tech, low-energy um, boxes built within the historic fabric of the building. Uh, and they're on easy access display, so researchers can get the models out and they can be sent out on loan and so on. But what that did was created a huge amount of space because the storage had become compact and we created a permanent exhibition with the best of the best of the national collections on display to the public on a whole variety of themes and a touring exhibition gallery. Now the business model around that is that the National Museum is paying the charity a rental for the storage. I have the advantage of their collections on display in a touring exhibition gallery which I operate at risk but if my visitor numbers increase, I take all the income from those, but I take all the risk and the cost associated with that. And as part of the project, we managed to restore three little commercial units, which are now fully rented out and are bringing in a steady income. So I've got three income sources from one building. Our visitor numbers from the 24th of July 2010, when we opened, have been 25% up. Our visitor income has been 28% up and I'm getting my rent from the two different sources. Now that's a, a brilliant business model that's, that's actually contributing to the wider works of the, the trust across the site. We also had to take risk. In the end, the final project, the smaller project, was a £13.5 million project. We had to run that. The National Museums didn't run it. So 
My, my advice to smaller institutions is don't be afraid to knock on the door of, of bigger partners, whether they're national or your local museum or art gallery or library. Um, be prepared to take responsibility if it matters to you. Um, show passion and commitment and um, just take a leading role and make sure that you are connecting with the right people and that, that you recognise how important personality is because it's sometimes not always the right people that smaller institutions are introduced to in the first place. So you have to be persistent in knocking on that door and saying, no, I've got to talk to this person. One of my roles is, is to chair an organisation called the Association of Independent Museums, AIM. Um, and AIM is all about museums and heritage sites that, that generally make the majority of their income themselves from trading activities or uh, visitor income or whatever. And the thing that, that um, typifies an AIM organisation generally is it's much, much smaller than the historic yard at Chatham. Um, it's often volunteer led. Um, but they are, what it says on the tin, they're independent. And they're independent of thinking. And as a really good example, a lot of us get some money from a local authority, but none of us would ever dream of being dependent upon that money. You see it as a business opportunity if you can deliver a service in the way that many social enterprises do on behalf of the local authority. Perhaps it might be working with young offenders or something like that. Providing it's furthering your aims and there's an income stream that comes with it, brilliant way of doing things. But if your whole restoration program is based on that and there's nothing else, government policy will change and you'll lose it. Guaranteed. I can, I can tell you hundreds of projects where that, that's been the case. Going right back to the youth opportunities schemes of the 80s. So the key thing is don't be dependent on any one source of income and develop other sources of income. As an example here at Chatham, our most profitable income line is film location work. It's not our highest turnover by many means, and this year we'll have, we'll have had a bottom line return of about £100,000. We worked hard at that, it's been a deliberate strategy, and the, you, you have to be quite clever about it, you have to have a website that shows the sorts of things that, that location managers are looking for. You, you have to work really closely with the location managers, you have to bend over backwards, but my goodness it's profitable. Now, some museums are a little bit sniffy about using their site for that because what happens is it gets changed a bit, not in a permanent way. If that income is sufficient to help you restore another building, it must be worth the aggravation. And I think it's, it's, it's what I always come back to is entrepreneurialism. It's looking at your asset, and, and most of us have heritage buildings and so on, which are, it's, it's marginal whether they're assets or liabilities, but they are your, your object, your thing, physical asset. How else can we make money out of it? Too many museums, for instance, think that retailing or catering is going to be their saviour. If most museums were honest at the smaller end, their, their catering and retail make very little money. But a huge amount of effort goes into it because the turnover feels nice. Um, think differently. You know, we all know about wedding venues. Are, are you capable of being a wedding venue? If you are, think about the impact that might have on your day visitors. If you're kicking them out every time you have a wedding, maybe it's not the best thing to do. But on the other hand, there might be a way. Um, are you a film location potential? Is, 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 in your, is there established in your area uh, uh, an agency that, that sells film locations? Certainly in Kent, as an example, and in Medway, they've both got um, location agencies and there's big business there. Um, are you a place where events can make money? Have you got buildings that you're using for museum use that actually aren't, aren't adding much value? They're very marginal. Could those be rented out to somebody? And I can hear screams all around the place going, but that's their purpose. Well, actually, if they are marginal and hardly anybody goes to them and the collection's in and you know, you know the galleries need updating and they're actually damaging your core visitation because they're not as good as the rest of the things, 
would you not be better to get some income from that little room that might fund you updating another gallery later on? It's that kind of thinking, and, and it, it, it's impossible to be prescriptive about how people should raise the extra money. Sometimes it's people's time. Most of us are, um, horrible word, but probably experts in a particular subject or something. Are you selling it? Or are you giving it away too often, that, that expertise and knowledge? Because certainly through the Association of Independent Museums, where we distribute grants on behalf of um, the Pilgrim Trust and Esme Fairburn Foundation to only to small museums, those grants are only up to £5,000. But we, we've distributed about uh, half a million pounds worth of those now over the four years. And we know the difference it makes. So in many organisations, I, I hear at Chatham talk about millions. To many people, you know, thousands or a few tens of thousands make the difference. And it's probably sitting on your doorstep. But you've got to free your thinking. But not ever in a way that damages your objectives. And we are so strict here that we, we look at our core objectives and we say, is that activity furthering our objectives? And if it isn't, you just don't do it. And we're the same with partnerships. Is it what I call a partnership of purpose? If it moves us forward, great. If it just brings in some money that neither furthers our objectives or the partnership doesn't add to our objectives, then we don't want to do that one. That's for someone else. So you've got to be very focused.